Thank you very much, Sky. Thank you so much for the invitation. It is a chalk talk, so feel free to complain if you cannot see what I'm writing. And this is a card shuffling talk. So I, I'm trying to keep it very understandable. If I somehow don't manage to do that, you should feel free to stop me. So I will start with, is there enough light? I hope, I hope you guys can see, yeah. I'll start with uh, three card shuffling models. Uh, you can pick your favorite one. Um, but the talk will be about these three. The first one is random transpositions. So in all these uh, shuffling schemes, we have a deck of n cards. Distinct cards. In this particular, the random transposition ones, what we do is that the right hand picks a card uniformly at random, the left hand picks a card uniformly at random, and you swap them. Might be that you choose the same card. You just say fix in this case. So. Pick two cards uniformly at random with repetition the way I described it uh, and swap them. Um, and the question that we ask in card shuffling, there, there can be many questions in mathematics, but in card shuffling, we ask how many times do we need to repeat this process to shuffle the deck well enough? And of course, I'll turn everything into mass. Uh, before I do that, of course, it's clear to everyone, this is not how we should be shuffling a deck of cards. This is not a model to be followed. Uh, Daikomis and Shashahani famously proved that it takes one half n log n steps to shuffle the deck well enough, which I will make rigorous soon. Um, so it takes a very long time. Uh, the reason why I care about it is because it offered us a very global technique on how to diagonalize n factorial by n factorial transition matrices and so on. Um, and of course, there are applications to physics and biology we can discuss, but as a mathematician, I care about the techniques right now. And this, this talk is all about the techniques. Uh, in case you care about the interchange process, this can be viewed as the interchange process on the complete graph. If you know what I'm talking about, you have the complete graph, you uh, place a card per node. And what you do is that you pick an edge uniformly at random and you swap with probability one half or you don't swap with probability one half. Um, okay, the laziness changes, so perhaps this one half changes, but that's how we view it as an interacting particle system. And the reason why I bring this up is because the second model uh, for today, the star transpositions, is interchange process on the star graph. So again, we have a deck of n cards. And what we do is that we pick one card uniformly at random, and we swap it with the top card. And now to answer this specific question, Daikon is used the word, the work of Plato, Odilisco, and Wales to say that it takes n log n steps to shuffle this. And again, we have another technique using representation theory uh, to diagonalize this model. And finally, the last shuffle, which is Right now, the hardest one uh, is random to random, uh, random to random, yes. Um, which says, pick a card uniformly at random, remove it from the deck, and insert it back into a random position. Mm -hmm. 
And we finally know cutoff for this. This is um, the lower bound due to Eliram Subag and the upper bound due to Bernstein and myself. That it takes a weird term of three fourths and then uh, steps to shuffle this. So um, these three models um, have contributed three different spectral techniques. Uh, to study mixing time um, and cutoff. Um, even though today the talk will not be about cutoff itself, it will be about a sharper question that I will define soon. So I'll attempt to move this up just to keep them around for a while. Just because this way we can learn with the models. And so I want to turn all of this into math now, and in particular, the question of shuffling well. So a configuration of the deck corresponds to a configuration of the symmetric group, an element in the symmetric group. So so for example, when we buy the deck, the cards come in order, that's the identity element. If we swap, say, the top two cards, that will give us the transposition one, two, and so on. Um, so now, if I have two permutations, uh, we define the transition matrix. <laughs> be the probability of moving from X to Y after one step of the process. And which process you care about? Well, you choose one of these three and you get a different transition matrix. Um, at least for these three models, the goal was to diagonalize these matrices and use the spectral information to see how long it takes to shuffle a deck of cards. Now, these are n factorial by n factorial matrices. This is a trivial task. Um, let's see why diagonalizing a matrix is relevant to the um, shuffling process. So if we take the t power of p and look at the xy entry, this will give us the probability of moving from X to Y, but now after T steps. And we understand powers of matrices through the diagonalization much more easily. So already we can see how the eigenvalues come into play. Um, let's denote this this way, just because now as Y varies, this is a probability measure. Um, and if we let T go to infinity, a classical theory will tell us that these values will start looking like one over n factorial uh, for every x and y. And this is the convergence we want to understand. Rigorously, the norm that we usually care about is total variation distance. I mean, there are other ones. In fact, we will talk about the L2 norm today as well. Uh, but this is the traditional one. It's basically the L1 norm. So definition is the variation distance between this measure and the uniform measure on SN is, as I said, one half of the L1 norm. Of course, you don't have to have uh, the symmetric group. You could have another Markov chain on your favorite graph and 
the, the stationary measure here. I'll restrict myself to the symmetric group today just for simplicity. Um, the mixing time now says, give me an error. What is acceptable to you? Give me an epsilon. <laughs> It is just the first time that this thing becomes less than epsilon. So here I'm supposed to maximize over uh, all starting points, take the worst starting point. I'm in a group in this case, uh, I can start at the identity and I'll be getting the same type of answer. So from now on, I'll have the identity. Uh, this is the setup. This is what the question is. So if there are any questions, this is a good moment to stop me. Uh, because we are going to go now into results, a little bit of history, and then into the techniques and the math. Um, okay. Let me come here then. Um, so I want to write what the theorem looks like, and perhaps I'll write the theorem for random transpositions. Um, is the podium uh, bad here uh, for anyone? Um, There's uh, many places one could move in this room to. I'll come, I'll come, this, I'll come this way. I don't think you have to move. We should. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able to see, that's all. <laughs> so the theorem of Diaconis and Sasha Honey. And you can adjust this theorem to this other card shuffle says that for random transpositions, A, if we take one half n log n steps plus a little bit more. Then the total variation distance, let's just call <laughs> this thing this is dt so that I don't write it all the time. The total variation distance dt is less than e to the minus c. And right now I'm not careful about constants. Soon I will be very precise. Uh, I mean, this is good. Here the constants might be, might be a two here or whatever. Um, and B, if I take a few less steps, then the total variation distance is basically one. Um, and again, we know exactly how, how close to one. Uh, I'll give you a formula very soon. Um, and you, the start transpositions just take this one half away. Um, and the random to random is actually a little bit trickier because there is a, a weird window factor there, but I don't want to write it right now, perhaps at the end if we have time. Okay, so this um, theorem describes what we know as the cutoff phenomenon. Um, and I will actually raise here. to draw a picture and then get into the limit profiles discussion. <clears throat> so this was one of the first incidents of Kato. Uh, I think Aldous and Daikonis were the ones to uh, look into it, into card shopping through some other models but perhaps this was the next paper discussing cutoff. So if we plot the total variation distance in terms of time, we see a picture like this. So we start being equal to one and we stay equal to one for a very long time. And suddenly we have this sharp transition like what happened log n and 
after that, we are very, very well mixed. And before that, we're not mixed at all. This is what this um, describes. The formal definition I am going to give right now, because I need it. So if we have a sequence of Markov chains, sequence of Markov chains, let's say on the symmetric group, again, you can have a different space. Um, then XT exhibits cattle. at Tn with window Wn if one Wn is little o of Tn. So the Wn here is n, which is little o of n log n. And then B, if I take the total variation distance at Tn, Plus a little bit more, and then take first take the limit with respect to n, and then the limit with respect to c. That's going to be zero. So I'm very well shuffled. If I change this to a minus, then this limit changes to a one. These are the three conditions for cutoff to be. Um, and this is what this picture basically describes for n large. Okay, is this uh, definition clear? Because the limit profile is something more than this. This just asks, what do I do at infinity and applies in this infinity? Limit profile asks, what is the exact function at any C? So. <laughs> It's the limit as n goes to infinity of Tn plus Cwn if this exists. So the first question I get is does cutoff imply the existence of limit profile? What under what conditions do we have the existence of this function? Is it well defined? I don't know, this is an excellent question. It's an excellent project. For the rest of the talk, you can think of lim soups and lim ims, but at least for the first two um, card shuffles, we know the limit profile. So naturally, my open question is, what's the limit profile for the last one? Uh, okay, so this is a little bit of, now we are trying to develop techniques for this for this uh, limit profile thing. Uh, but limit profiles have been noticed in the past. Um, in particular, let's write down a few models where we know uh, the limit profiles. And it's been a while, like 30 years or, or so, where we know some limit profiles. <laughs> so for example, in card shuffling, We have the referral shuffles, which is the way that people should be shuffling a deck of cards. It's the one where you cut the deck roughly into half and you riffle. And if you have 52 cards, you know that you need to do roughly seven shuffles. Um, so this is the theorem of fire diaconis, <laughs> who proved that it takes three over two log base two steps to shuffle a deck of cards with a constant window. Um, and the limit profile is a function of a normal zero one, basically. So I can write it down if you want to see the exact function. I have it on my notes, but I don't remember it on top of my head. And here, um, the statistic that they could study is the number of increasing sequences. So uh, there was a very combinatorial feature that gave them the entire behavior. 
random walks on Ramanujan graphs. I had it for you here. <laughs> so, Lubetsky and Paris determined the cutoff for simple random walk on Ramanujan graphs, but in fact, they said that again, there is a normal zero one uh, behavior for the limit profile, which comes from central limit theorem because it comes from the backtracking. Um, so again, there is some statistic that gives away the limit profile uh, in this case. And I'll write a more uh, a different, like an interactive particle system, um, the asymmetric exclusion process for people who like interacting particle uh, systems with closed boundaries. Um, it's a new work by Lupit of Nature uh, that gives a limit profile. And what is that? We are with a K particles in the segment that moves to the right with bias P basically and to the left with one minus P and somehow this bias gives you a limit profile that is a function of GU. So these are just three examples. There's nothing for you to think about, but all I'm trying to say is that the probabilistic techniques that we have are usually some CLT, some basically CLT all the time, but um, there's no technique. It's more like I found a good statistic and it gives me the behavior. So now I want to discuss some spectral techniques for studying um, limit profiles. And the story started with random transpositions and a master's student in France. So his name is Lucas Desier. Uh, I know he's uh, applied for postdocs this year and he's just marvelous. You should all try to get him. Um, what he proved, well, his advisor just gave him tra random transpositions to, to study, and he came back proving a conjectural diagonalness, uh, which was open for 20 years. And what he proved is that for random transpositions, the limit uh, profile behavior at time one half n log n plus cn and c can be negative as well is given by the total variation distance of two poissons a poisson one plus e to the minus c and a poisson one why was this conjectured well we already knew that Random transpositions, the long cycles mix very fast, much faster than, than um, uh, the mixing time. And the statistic that keeps um, um, resisting is the number of fixed points. And so if someone just studies, how long does it take for the number of fixed points to get down to one, which is uh, the correct for the stationary distribution that behaves like a Poisson one plus e to the minus c, as it goes to infinity. Um, but that's why the conjecture was out there. Um, and he proved it using Fourier inversion. So he took basically the ideas of Daikon such as Shahani and he manipulated them in a very smart way. Uh, and so at least one theorem that I will discuss today is that here. So the two techniques I will discuss are DCS and a comparison technique that I developed for star transpositions, which says for star transpositions, Uh, 
at the cut of time, the limit profile is exactly the same as um, random dispositions. And this is proven by a comparison type of argument. So the motivation is that if we are, if I am on the complete graph doing card shuffling, this interchange process, or if I am at the star graph, roughly taking two steps in the star graph, roughly that should be like doing things in the complete graph. That's the motivation. How to prove it is a different type of story. But we expect somehow the two behaviors to be similar. <clears throat> Any questions on the results or the discussion so far? If, if um, like, should the n log n plus cn be twice the half n log n plus cn then? Like, it, it, yeah, so first of all, let's see here, this was a parenthesis here. Oh, okay. Yeah, if that's what you're asking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I had it right, which I didn't write. Unfortunately, it won't be the last typo I make, so please feel free to um, complain more. Yeah, any other questions? But uh, really, if I say I hadn't forgotten this, then there would have been a two over here or something like this. Roughly, I'm still in the same type of uh, behavior. So what we are trying to do now is say that we can do so much more than just the limits uh, to infinity and minus infinity. We can somehow uh, get the entire behavior if we know the entire spectrum. So let's see how, how that comes in the picture. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, and what shall I erase now? Shall let me try to move this. Actually, I don't think I can move this up and move this down. You're supposed to hold both sides and lift them up. You have a big arm span. It's very heavy. It's very heavy. Oh, we engineered that, Enrico. Now, the small boards are okay, but that board is not. It's huge. So, so, let's go back to Daiko and Sancho Shahani. Um, and what they did is they took the transition matrix, say these card chuckles, it works for all of them, and say, okay, I want to diagonalize them. I'm going to do Fourier inversion um, for a presentation theory, whichever way you want to see it. So if this is similar to a block diagonal matrix, I'll define these things in a moment. Everything outside the blocks is zero. And what are these p hat row i's? So first of all, the row i's are irreducible representations of the symmetric group, and we won't mention them again in this talk, but for now I want to write it down. So these are group homomorphisms that cannot be decomposed any further. So irreducible representations. And P hat at row is basically their average through this transition matrix. So if I start at the identity and look at with what probability gamma G, that's the weight of rho I G. And we add over every element of the symmetric group. Now, naturally, assume we do random transpositions, only the transpositions will have a positive weight or the identity. So most of these uh, coefficients here are zero. And why is this simple to study in the case of random transpositions? 
because it's a conjugacy class and there is Shor's lemma, whatever that is, that says that actually this guy, so these blocks are already diagonal. And in fact, for random transpositions, these P hats, whatever they are, here, then the I times the identity um, the dimension here matches. Um, so then the question was, okay, can I get my hands on this beta i? So we just take traces in this formula and uh, the eigen, we retrieve a formula for these eigenvalues in terms of characters of their reduced representations. I'm not going there right now, I'm just taking you step by step uh, uh, through the, what happened. Um, this is very nice for random transpositions. It is not true for star transpositions. I mean, these things are diagonal, but they're not uh, a, multi a scalar multiple of the identity. They are diagonal for random to random, but they're not lambda times the identity. And it is way, way harder to come up with, to, to, to find these values, to find all the eigenvalues. What happens for star transpositions is that the eigenvalues that matter that the representations that matter are almost lambda times the identity. So that was already a nice similarity, which agrees with our motivation that doing the card shuffle on the star graph versus the complete What's graph. Better, the big ones or the small ones? Uh, the ones that matter are the ones that have large first row. So n minus one dimensional and so on. So the n minus one dimensional is exactly the number of fixed points in terms of the character, which is, I told you the statistic that we care about. It's not the only one that matters, unfortunately, in the analysis, but uh, only finite of them matter. Okay. Okay, so this, um, why is this relevant? I have started talking to you about uh, eigenvalues. I mean, I told you already that getting our hands onto P to the T goes through the eigenvalue analysis. How so? The L2 lemma, which is basically, this is a simplification of what Diakonis and Shahan proved. Their, their uh, lemma was in terms of uh, Fourier transforms. What I'm going to write is Cauchy's parts that four times the total variation distance squared, I do Cauchy's parts, is less or equal than the eigenvalues to the 2t, I remove the first one. So in all our cases, the transition matrix P, all three um, things, P is symmetric. Okay. So we know it has real eigenvalues, beta zero, beta one, I order them. And graph theory tells us that the first one is always equal to one. And then the fact that we are irreducible, whatever that means, we have a generating set basically says that the next one is less than one. And the fact that the identity happens with cause and probability says that I'm less, uh, bigger than minus one. So these values over here are real. And in absolute value, they are uh, less than one. If we take T to infinity, this sum indeed goes to zero, just to give you a small proof of the convergence. Uh, type of theorem. Um, so this business of diaconis and Shahani is just to tell you how to get the hands on um, the eigenvalues. And as I said, for star transpositions, flat out Lisbo whales came up with another technique. And recently, Dyker and Sayola introduced the wonderful lifting eigenvector techniques for random to random, which I believe works in many, many other uh, setups which we haven't studied yet. So trying to work on that. But for now, this is what we have. Um, so what did Tessier do? He, he said, I don't want to do an L2 bound. I want to really get my hands on the total variation distance. So if I also have my hands on the orthonormal eigenbases, of P. So P has real eigenvalues, but spectral theorem tells us that it also has an orthonormal eigenbasis. Then we have an exact formula for total variation distance and time T. We 
which I will copy from my notes because I don't want, if you guys are broadcasting, so I better uh, not write anything wrong. Um, just to be happy with myself. Yes, here. Um, so I'm writing it only for the symmetric group, I guess. Some. F of the identity, I start at the identity here, um, F at Y, it wasn't that far after all, actually, I should have it on my own. And here I add over all J. That's fine. So all you need to care about is that the total variation distance can be written explicitly as an exact expression of eigenfunctions, at the starting point and at the averaging points and the eigenvalues. Um, Lucas' formula was actually written in terms of characters and Fourier transforms, um, but uh, in a paper with uh, uh, Samuel Lisker Taylor, we wrote a more general version. This works for any reversible Markov chain. Here you have a stationary measure, um, and we were able to manipulate it for Markov chains that are not random also loops. So. This is the most general uh, version. And his idea, which also worked in our setup later on, was that actually only a subset of these indices matters and the other ones we can throw away to an error. So the lemma says that for every subset of the indices, so here one, all the way to an factorial to the symmetric group, but can do it for your favorite kind of Markov chain. This will be the main term. And the error will be something like this. So Um, J not in I and not equal to zero. So the orthogonality of the eigen uh, functions somehow gives a nice formula for the error. Um, and you can use this, as I said, in a general setup. So this here really played with the characters of the symmetry group to get his hands on this. Um, main term, which I told you already, is just going through partitions that have large first row. <clears throat> and he gets this Poisson behavior over here. And everything else, all other representations give an error that goes to zero with that. So that's what he did. It was brilliant. Um, and he did this as part of his master's thesis. Um, OK, so then I want to tell you about star transpositions, um, which might not be necessarily the most exciting model, but it gave a new technique. And to be fair, it was towards my effort to study random to random. Uh, but the technique doesn't work for random to random, and I'll tell you that in a moment too. So to prove this theorem, instead I'm going to prove that whatever limit profile random transpositions has, star transpositions will have the same. And the lemma says the following. Assume you have two transition matrices, P and Q, reversible, <laughs> on SN now transition. Could be on any space you want them to be reversible and you want them to have the same stationary measure such that they commute pq is equal to qp that's the assumption you need um 
Um, now let's say um, for the patient, P exhibits cut off. At TN, this is an assumption again, WN with eigenvalues. Theta I say, and Q exhibits path of a T and star with window W and star with eigenvalues QI. Then the lemma says, four times the limit profile for P at C. Now here it is implied this cut of time and this window minus like the, the limit profile at Q at C is less or equal than the following limit as n goes to infinity because this is for the symmetric group right now. Beta i minus qi, actually beta i to the t minus qi to the t, all of it squared. Here, this is not, these are not the ranked eigenvalues. This means that beta i and qi share the same eigenvector. Um, and this is the lemma uh, now that we are writing. Because commuting means that you have a common orthonormal eigenbasis. Um, and so we're stuck. So, okay, that's the lemma, which might sound restrictive. Why do you need them to commute? But it happens a lot. So, random transpositions and star transpositions commute. <clears throat> but in fact, star transpositions, sorry, random transpositions commute with any symmetric random walk on the symmetric group. That's a small exercise. My original paper, I had the proof for these. Uh, and then Laurent of course, told me whenever you have a conjugacy invariant uh, measure, that will commute with uh, every random walk. So it's there. And so this is a comparison type of lemma comparing two limit profiles. Comparison has been a central idea in Markov chain mixing. So Daikonis and Salov Kost has comparison uh, theorems for comparing eigenvalues. And usually it is the case that you take a conjugacy invariant random walk. We diagonalize it using the Iconis and Shahani ideas. And then you compare the random walk you actually care for with this conjugacy invariant random walk. So these assumptions are what we've been doing already in the community. We study the conjugacy invariant guys, and then everything else mutes with them. So it's not that bad. And of course, what I'm claiming, um, so here I wasn't careful. It's at their respective times. That's why I had to write them. Um, what I'm claiming is that these differences go to zero. And that's because the main eigenvalues of star transpositions uh, squared are basically the same as the eigenvalues of uh, random transpositions, the main ones. And the other ones just don't matter. They're tiny anyway. So they go to zero in the times are multiplicity. So this was the idea. Um, and I want to finish a little bit with random uh, to random because, um, well, okay, I'm, I'm obsessed with random to random, obviously, but uh, it really gives you new techniques and new ideas. Already this was conceived, hoping that one could uh, study random to random. The problem with random to random, even though we know all these things over here, is that this thing does not go to zero when you compare to random transpositions. I thought it would. Um, and in fact, it gives us the idea that it might have a different limit profile than random transpositions. Uh, it might not be this sort of variation distance of Poisson's. So one perhaps should start taking a look at the cycle structure of uh, uh, random uh, to random. It could be that there we have a different, more interesting behavior of how cycles mix. There are other cycles that um, contribute. I think um, it's just an indication.
So while for random transpositions, we had an interesting behavior when one was taking the spectral gap or the second largest eigenvalue to the 2T and taking uh, their multiplicity, which is n squared, so this was two. And somehow the biggest eigenvalue was giving away the cutoff time. Here you need one half um, n log n steps to make this small. Um, for random to random, that's not the case. For random to random, so this is one eigenvalue contributing. We have square root of n eigenvalues. contributing to cutoff. Um, in particular, um, instead of n squared, so here you have n squared that contribute, here you have n to the three over two contributing, and this gives a three over four uh, constant that uh, we discussed. And the other ones are basically zero. So <coughs> they cannot behave the same way. Uh, these are, this uh, is discussing a little bit the n minus one dimensional representation. Whatever, meaning following the ace of space, that's what it means. You follow one card, you look at the eigenvalues, and you notice a very different behavior of n squared eigenvalues determining everything versus n to the three over two. And I want to finish with a conjecture, something that I sort of have an idea right now and hope to prove. which is that for total variation distance, I still have no clue what the limit profile is for um, random transpositions. Of course, I hope to do that. But for separation distance, what is that? That is you look at the distance of these two ratios, so you start at the identity, you're at y after t steps, you divide by the uniform measure, and you maximize over y. No absolute values, this is not the L infinity norm, this is not a norm. For this thing, which is widely studied in Markov chain mixing, I hope that the behavior for random transposition or random to random, so conjecture, let me not, ST is given by open collector. So gamble distribution, uh, meaning that uh, for random to random. <laughs> Random, random, I hope this is super collecting, um, which is uh, agreeing with the initial motivation of Diaconis. He thought that once you pick all cards that you are shuffled, but that turned out to be wrong. Um, still, I think the dis limiting distribution might be gamble. Um, and then, of course, open questions for this are other card shuffles. We have not studied the separation limit profile. Um, so I'll end up with this conjecture and an open question for random to random for total variation distance. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Can you use these spectral techniques on, on uh, you know, what I do with just adjacent transpositions and, and, and is there a spectral version of the kinds of questions that you and I have been talking about? So to diagonalize adjacent transpositions, yeah. I've heard Percy saying that he believes that this might even be any hard. I don't know whether, whether this is correct, but no. okay. Um, <laughs> we, we know the we know the spectral gap, we know the largest ones, but we don't know all of them. And so, I, I mean, I don't think you need to determine the spectrum. It's just a question of 
you know, uh, for example, at, or I'm not even after cutoff phenomena, just just be able to identify the times at which, you know, infinite cycle, or, or macroscopic cycles form. Oh, so 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 in terms of macroscopic, yeah, yeah. so I know in terms of mixing, we know cutoff for adjacent transpositions on the segment. Good. We know the exact constant, we know the exact order, everything. It is due to Hubert Lacroix, uh, the upper bound and the lower bound is due to Wilson. Um, I haven't seen anything, I mean, other than what we were discussing, the work no. by uh, uh, L. Boyman Sly uh, discussing the cycle structure. But in one dimension, it should be fairly. Yes, it should be more tractable. It should be much more accessible, right? Uh, you to, to study the cycle structure, yeah. but to convert it into mixing, that's also an extra step. Yeah, that's, yeah. Do you, is, there a, is there a way to convert it into mixing or? The only work I have seen is, you know, the one due to Shram and then later on yeah. the Cooney, um, Bersetti, Shram, they, they, they turned it into mixing, but in the mean field case, not the uh, second. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very much interested in this to see this mean field technique. Does it work on other graphs? And I told you, I think the first candidate to try something like this is the star graph. Oh, yeah. Right, because it's, it's um, I believe it's similar. I mean, I've proved it is similar, but uh, perhaps even in this long cycle structure, it is similar. If it fails there, if we cannot technically uh, prove it, then I don't, I wouldn't dare to touch the, the segment, but who knows, I might be wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have like a specific example of a telegraph? Uh, you'd like to show the cutoff phenomena, but you don't know how to do it? Uh, Yes. <laughs> Let's stick to the symmetric group. Um, I think a fascinating question, which I was already thinking of, and then Peter also asked me later, was what if you just take two generators of the symmetric group? <clears throat> and one bad generating set that Peter wouldn't be interested in would be something like take. Let's say the transposition one, two, and the end cycle one, two, and n, plugging the inverse two just to make it symmetric, add the identity as well, just so that you're not a periodic. So, say with probability one fourth, you do the transposition, probability one fourth, you do the end cycle, the inverse, or the identity. We know that the order of mixing is n cube log n. So, we have Pre cutoff, we know the upper and upper bound or bond, we don't know cutoff for this. Um, and what is interesting with this card shuffle, so whenever you shuffle only with transpositions, there is this big theorem uh, called Aldous conjecture, which has been proven uh, by Caputo and others, um, that the spectral gap of the card shuffle lies in following the ace of spades. So the ace of spades follows uh, the transition matrix is n by n. You just need to know the position on the graph. Um, and that's where you find the spectral gap, the second largest second value. For this thing, that's not true. The second largest second value is not in the n minus one dimensional representation or in following the ace of spades. So this is a tricky one. There are other generating sets, of course, say with finite number of elements that you can try, but it is a hard question. And I think it would be very interesting to prove cutoff when you have fixed number of generators. So, so how do you formulate the question where you have, let's say, a finite number of generators? What's the, how do you? Uh, in, in this specific generating set? Yeah, here you uh, you draw the Cayley graph with respect to this generator okay. set, and you start, say, the identity, and you pick one of the edges from the front yeah, of it. There is a choice of bounded number of generators with which it's an expander. That's, uh, there is a that choice. Is. How many, how many That's generators? Larson and someone else, right? Um, um, what's his mm -hmm. name? I mean, there's a recent proof now with this mapping class group having property T, then you can use the product replacement, which is the very Kassabon. simple. What? Was it Casabon? Casabon. Casabon. Yeah. Because I can try to find this paper to Larson. Yeah, it's Casabon. But there's a new proof of it. Oh. Okay, that sounds great. I uh, the property T will give you, uh, I think, cutoff. Yeah. It will give you cutoff as well. I think it will. Well, at least it gives you the gap. Gives you the yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, this would give you the correct it's, it's order no, of things. The big difference is it's no longer a conjugacy class random walk. That's, that's big. So you not can't use that. You can't use character theory. Right. It really is not homogeneous. Yeah. Like even random to random, the generators are homogeneous in some sense, even though they're not a conjugacy yeah. class. Yeah. This is a, a different feature for that reason. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's a good question. What are the best generators of a symmetric group in terms of just word? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Now let's think of Ida again. 